Yes, marriage is what brings us together. Now let's go ahead and look at a marriage contract in Old Babylonian, the Old Babylonian dialect of Akkadian. This marriage contract is 4,000 years old. It's a, a fun piece to get us started in, in this type of literature, this genre of, um, call it contract literature, uh, smaller piece deals, you know, things that'll get us into receipts and, and whatnot. So this marriage contract, if you're following along in Hunergard's grammar, is in an abbreviated form on page 166. It's exercise 17G. Um, if not, here is the, the longer version. And uh, we're going to go ahead by looking at the cuneiform itself to get started. If you look on the left, this is the Old Babylonian cursive style. It's a little different than the lapidary inscriptional style that you're going to see. If you've looked at the Codex Hammurabi, for example, um, the Hammurabi stele is written in a lapidary version, much prettier to my eye. Uh, different people may you know, have a different opinion. Uh, you know, the, the tablets look cool themselves, but cool looking versus, you know, prettier looking. Uh, maybe it's not an objective statement, but if it helps uh, you, you know, distinguish between the two, so be it. Now, getting us started, we see that the cuneiform is written beginning with a determinative to note someone's name. It's the dish sign, the, um, the number one or the stroke downward. And it's just indicating a personal name here. And the first three lines give us the name of the first party, Bashtum Marat Belitsinu Sinishti Shamash Marat Utsibitum. And so Bashtum is her name, and the rest is sort of the surname or family name. And Belizunu um, or Belisunu, uh, another way of articulating Belichunu. Uh, line four, we have the second party, and it's just Ramun Marsham Khatum. And so Ramun is, it sounds like Ramon. Um, and believe it or not, there are people from the Middle East, modern Assyrians, for example, who have this name. I know some. And so Ramum here is the male party. And then in five and six, you see Ana Ashutim Umututim Ichuz. Um, Ichuz, you know, just a three MS, which is interesting. Um, so he took or she took for what? Ashutim Umututim for womanhood and manhood right? For wifehood and husbandhood. Um, that's kind of cool. Uh, it's an interesting way to articulate a marriage. Now in uh, line seven, um, what she got for this marriage is not quite clear. Seven and eight give us blank. There's a broken piece. And then sort of the end of where we would see uh, the gin to mark shekels. So shekel kaspi. Um, terhats, terhatsha, terhasa, right? So her uh, dowry or bride price, something like that. We don't, we just don't know the number and um, makes you wonder how much was it? How much was it worth? But we do know that she was at least happy when she got it. Um, <laughs> Ula Numa, Ula Numa libisha erish. Nine and 10 give us that since she received it, her heart has been satisfied. And um, for line 10, her heart has been satisfied. You get this frozen uh, Sumerian phrase, or it's probably a Sumerian phrase, shagani uh, alduk, you know, it's either a phrase or just a, no, it's a, call it a phrase. And so it's at least a line that as it's written is understood by being written, right? Sometimes the way, a case of a logographic phrase, a case of a logographic phrase. Now, starting in 11, we see some of the conditions for if there's problems in the marriage. Um, so I'll go ahead and read Shuma Bashtum Ana Remun Mutisha Ulmuti Ata Ektabi. If Bashtum has said to her husband, You are not my husband, something bad's going to happen to her. What is that? Well, 15 and 16 explain. Icha uh, Shushima Ananarim Inadu. So they will bind her and chuck her into the river, right? And so, you know, there's some uh, challenges on 16 reading river, you know, uh, which which signs are there exactly. It's broken, but, you know, binding and, and throwing with a piece of a river word, you know, we know it's a river, right? That's what people do. They, unless they throw them into the fire, which is far more rare. In fact, I've, I think I've only seen one instance of it apart from the book of Daniel, um, you know, in cuneiform. Uh, so, you know, it's people get tossed in the river all the time. In fact, it's called the river ordeal, you know, where people have to sometimes as a consequence of a legal penalty have to um, 
endure being thrown into a river. Things aren't so bad for Rimum if you know he declares something similar. Shuma Rimum ana bashtum ashatishu ul ashati ati iktabi. If he declares or if he has said to Bashtum, his wife, you are not my wife, his penalty isn't so bad, depending on how wealthy he is. Um, he's going to have to pay 10 shekels of silver. Now, it's it's kind of interesting there. Like when we think of shekels, like we use it sort of as a denomination of currency. But what does shekel mean? Literally, this phrase is he has to weigh out 10 uh, silvers for her departing, for her divorce, for her um, uzubusha. So that's from um, ezebu or aizab, right? To to leave, to cast off her her departing, her you know whatever it costs for her to leave, <laughs> her alimony, right? Uh, her alimony. But the verb is just he'll weigh it out. He'll weigh out ten silvers, and so. Um, think about like how the, the English, you know, or the British system will use a pound, right? That's a weight measurement for a, a monetary denomination, right? So your, your money is your, are your pounds, your things weighed out. A shekel is the same. A shekel is a weighed out um, piece of here, metal, which is silver. Kaspam is just silver or money. Um, and so those are the consequences of the marriage. It's also interesting that divorce is just a declaration. I'm thinking it's a public declaration, but maybe it's not. I mean, maybe it's one of those things where if they said it, you know, there's a contract, like if they said it among themselves, you know, there would be some consequence to that, just vocalizing it. I think contractually, however, right, like this is a this is a public marriage, it's a public witness, it's a public contract. There are consequences for a divorce and speaking these words, right? Words have meaning. Um, and this is where it gets, you know, I would call it important or interesting is in lines 22 and 23, you see the, the oath formula, nishamash marduk shamsu eluna sharam u separ itmu. They swore by the life of the god, shamash, the sun god, marduk, the god of Babylon, shamsu uh, eluna, who is the king, right? And the city of Sippar. Uh, so they're swearing by all these things. Sippar, of course, is about a, uh, I don't know, it's less than an hour drive south of Baghdad. So um, they're right there in the middle of it. Marduk is the, you know, the god of the area, the god of Babylon. And um, here they are, you know, with divine witness. They're They're making an oath before people um, before the king, before the city, uh, before th these two gods in particular. And of course, they have a number of other eyeball witnesses who you know round out the end of the tablet. And so I think it's pretty fascinating that you know you see this this ancient marriage contract and then you see other things like you know in Genesis or Malachi, right where you have this oath swearing. Um, so it, it's, reminiscent of this covenantal marriage where marriage is, you know, I, I know it's popular in preaching circles to say it's a covenant, not a contract, but you know, what's a, you define the difference. I mean, maybe in a modern sense, but even in the past where there is a written contract, right. And this differs of course, from the, the Ketuvah and, and later Judaism, that is, you know, the, the long, sort of a formal marriage or matrimonial contract. Um, this is sort of a basic one about bringing people together and, and enduring certain consequences if they should separate, you know, let death do us part in a way, right? Like, so all of this is there and it's, it is covenantal. Like there is um, the testimony before the deities before the the gods, at least of Shamash and Marduk, um, along with them, the king and the city, right? So uh, that's that is something you see in scripture. That's something you see in in that provides some insight in how marriage is a recurring motif in scripture, right? And so you'll see that you know, between um, you know the community of of Israel and Adonai, or you know Yahweh, the the deity. And as well as the church and Christ, you know, the, the bride and the bridegroom, that there's a divine component to the idea of marriage. 
it's not merely a contract there yeah there's a human contractual element but it's done before and in the presence of it's it's sealed you could say um before you know the the divine elements in in the region so i thought this was a lot of fun for a short uh, little exercise and um you know take some time to you know try reading through it as best you can um you know, paying attention to the Sumerian logograms where you can and sort of what the forms would be. Um, you know, it's mostly G verbs, you know, here we see in the text. And maybe as you think about, you know, the the last piece of it, it it's easy to toss off the list of the witness names. But, um, you know, assuming this is a true document, these were real people. And um, here their names live on 4,000 years later. I mean, they lived, they witnessed an event um, you know, whether it was just two people being brought together or, or there, there's more to the story um, that we don't know about. Clearly, we don't know about, but here they were um, who were present and present enough to be put into writing as, as part of the contract. So uh, great stuff to think about. And one of the reasons why uh, I, I love this language and, and just what it reveals about the past, especially, you know, the, the earliest instances of um, you know, written humanity that we get from Mesopotamia, Beth Nahrin.